اوكي ست ناس ما ناخذين مربش رح يفضل يقول لي امي واحدة اكبر مني ثاني هو قولي um this is not him so today we're going to be talking about um acceptance and specifically acceptance um of divine decree um and there is a story i wanted to share with you all if i can just find it mm. Okay, um, I can't find it right now, but I think hmm. okay, this one okay. I'll we'll just start somewhere else. Great. So has anyone ever heard the uh the dua that is um has to be Allah Has anyone ever heard that one before? So you can in the chat just say yes or no. Yes. Yes. I I do read that, yes. Good, good, alhamdulillah. Does anyone know what it means? Okay, so has to be Allah and Amal Wakil literally means that Allah is sufficient for us as Allah and He is the best disposer of affairs. So, this, um, oh, I found the story. Uh, so, this phrase is something that uh, a lot of people kind of just say it sometimes. And I, I come from an Arab background, and like for a lot of Arab aunties and stuff, they'll like say it when they're really angry or upset. It has to be Allah and Amal Wakil, you know. But and it's become like a phrase that we say when we're in distress, which is great, but has become something that we're not really applying <laughs> in our day to day life. Because the this phrase is meant to remind us that everything that happens, Allah is sufficient for us, and He's the best disposer of affairs. Even when something, a calamity happens and it seems like it's the worst thing to happen, you remind yourself with this phrase, Hasbi Allah wa Ahmad Wakil. And this is a phrase that I've tried to start incorporating in my life a bit more when I'm feeling anxious about something, when something difficult is happening in my life, when I'm nervous about something. I just remind myself, Hasbi Allah wa Ahmad Wakil over and over. And so I hope that all of you can take this, uh, this phrase. Uh, maybe Google it, look it up, and try to memorize it, and just make it your kind of daily mantra when something stressful happens. Um, and one thing that I want to start with um, is the definition of stress. How many of you have been experiencing stress lately? <laughs> I think everybody, right? Um, no, none of us are, you know, in, impervious to the stress. Stress is uh, defined as when what is happening is not what you think ought should be happening. Stress occurs when what is happening is not what you feel like should be happening right now. So how many times, you know, in the future, as you get stressed, as you inevitably will, think about it. Am I stressed because... I feel like what's currently happening right now shouldn't be happening right now. And that's, yeah, I'm sure 100% of the time, the answer will be yes, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be stressed. If you feel like this should be happening, all of this is fine, I want this to happen, you wouldn't be stressed out, would you? Um, and I wanted to share a picture with you all. I'm going to share. Can anyone tell me what this is? You can just uh, unmute, say it out loud. Any idea what this could be a picture of? No idea. The pixels are just too uh, granular or yeah. ungranular. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
We could see some yellow, we could see some red, some brown, maybe beige. We have no idea what's going on. Um, maybe, maybe this actually looks like a dog. If you, if you <laughs> look at the, maybe you can draw on it. If you look like here, looks like the head of a dog. <laughs> this is the dog's ear right here. From here, then this is where the dog's eye would be. And this is the nose. You guys see the dog? Nose of the dog, and then here's the dog's smile. <laughs> Y'all see that? So. I still don't see it, but. You don't see the dog? <laughs> okay. Um, maybe if I can have a thicker. Um, it's okay. Um, there, this would be the eyeball of the dog, and it's the side profile of the dog's head. You see it? This is the nose. Yeah, yeah, thank you. The eye. Yeah, no problem. Um, so this is, you know, let's say that this is my life, and uh, I have this moment in my life, and I'm like, it's a dog. A dog is happening in my life right now. But let's zoom out. Okay, I'm going to stop annotating. not a dog. It's a really intricate, beautiful pattern of a rug. And this is what it means to be a human being in the realm of the divine. That we are so inside of something extremely intricate that is beyond our comprehension. And we don't have the divine bird's eye view to really make sense of what's going on. We are ants in a carpet. How the ant can only see the tiny little colors the, or the large swaths of colors to the ant. It's like huge chunks of color. That's all it's seeing. The ant has no conception, no conceivable way of comprehending such an intricate and elaborate and beautiful harmon harmonizing kind of artwork of symmetry and sense. This is the difference between us and Allah. And this is why when it comes to acceptance of divine decree, we have to kind of trust the expert with a capital E because we have no conceivable way to understand what the larger plan is, right? So I'm gonna read the story to you now that I found. Bismillah. The story is called, maybe so, maybe not. A farmer and his son had a beloved horse who helped the family earn a living. One day, the horse ran away, and their neighbors exclaimed, your horse ran away, what terrible luck. The farmer replied, maybe so, maybe not. A few days later, the horse returned home, leading a few wild horses back to the farm as well. The neighbor shouted out, your horse has returned and brought several horses with him, what great luck. The farmer replied, maybe so. Maybe not. Later that week, the farmer's son was trying to break one of the horses. Breaking a horse means like when the horse is wild and you're trying to tame uh, the horse to domesticate it. Later that week, the farmer's son was trying to break one of the horses and the horse threw him to the ground, breaking his leg. The neighbors cried, your son broke his leg, what terrible luck. The farmer replied, maybe so, maybe not. A few weeks later, Soldiers from the National Army marched through town, recruiting all the boys for the army, but they did not take the farmer's son because he had a broken leg. The neighbor shouted, your boy is spared, what tremendous luck. To which the farmer replied, maybe so, maybe not, we'll see. So what can we, what can we uh, gather from this story? Can also write in the chat if you don't want to unmute yourself. Was it good luck that his horse ran away? Was it bad luck that the horse brought other horses? Was it good luck? You know? I think we just don't know. 
Exactly. Because the story is developing onward and onward and onward, right? Someone on in the chat wrote something that it seems like a good thing can have a ne negative outcome later on and vice versa. Exactly. We don't really know what the grand plan is. We don't really know when something bad happens to us, what the outcome will be. For example, the son breaking his leg, it could have been like, we should have never had these horses come to us. We should have never done this regrets. And like, you know, I wish God didn't even bring us these horses, you know, but then the army didn't take the boy. And it was a blessing, right? And perhaps later it will become a tribulation. <laughs> but the reality is that every every new chapter in your life is an unfolding of this grand story of your entire life. And so we have both blessings and tribulations that are constantly happening to us, right? Both the blessing and the tribulation is an opportunity to grow and to get closer to Allah. For example, if we don't accept the blessing and take it with gratitude, right? We just kind of, blessings are happening to us and we're kind of not really paying attention. We're not expressing gratitude to Allah. Then we kind of miss an opportunity to get closer to Allah, through Allah's, Allah's jamal. Jamal meaning beauty. Jamal meaning, you know, um, mercy. Jamal being subtlety jamal being ease and if we don't ex accept our tribulations with a hand of patience and and a type of you know a patient awareness then we also have squandered our opportunity to grow to get closer to allah accepting and getting understanding allah's jalal jalal being you know awesome might and majesty, strength. So a lot of times it all comes down to our opinion of Allah, right? Sometimes when something bad happens to us, we think we're being punished. We think, you know, um, that we deserve it for, you know, just we just deserve pain and, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It's like complete nonsensical pain, just just like that we think that why me we think god hates us right but when it comes to an acceptance of divine decree you are remembering what this quote in the quran which is from um al -Baqara, uh, which is the second chapter of the quran ayah 216 it may be that you dislike something though it is good for you and it may be that you love something though it is bad for you and God knows and you do not know. So when we go to a doctor, this, is, this doctor is the best specialist in the world with the particular issue that you have. He's the best doctor in the world. And then he says to you, we have to cut you open and take one of your organs out. That sounds terrifying. You would never do that yourself. You would never suggest that for yourself, would you? But you understand and recognize the doctor knows that which you do not know. You understand that this doctor has knowledge that you can't even begin to to start comprehending because you haven't gone through med school and you haven't gone through all these you know um, trainings and studying you know years and years and even practice in the field to understand what this doctor understands so what do you do you, you put your hands up and you kind of trust the expert right or we might go to a mechanic the best mechanic in the world the most honest mechanic in the world right and you're like I have a problem with my car and the mechanic says well we have to do this this and that and it's going to cost you a lot of money you're going to trust that mechanic because that mechanic knows things that you don't know you you don't understand how this, this a car engine works you know for the, for the most part if you're the average person who doesn't have mechanic experience so you trust the expert similarly with Allah we have to trust the expert with a capital E because Allah knows more than the surgeon more than the mechanic more than anybody right of course God is a limitless, omniscient, omnipotent being, right? So part of acceptance of divine decree is recognizing like Allah, I am an ant in a carpet. You are an expert. I know nothing and you know. So I'm giving it to you. I'm going to give this to you entirely. And that means 
you still, as they say, tie your camel, and then the rest you have to kind of give to Allah. And the reference I'm making when I say tie your camel from a hadith of the Prophet, where one of the companions of the Prophet came to him and said, Oh, Ya Rasulullah, I want to have just trust in Allah and have tawakkul. Tawakkul means trust in God. I want to have tawakkul. Should I tie my camel or should I just have tawakkul in God? You know, so the camel doesn't run off. And the Prophet ﷺ said, tie your camel and have tawakkul. Meaning there's always, we, there's things within our control that we have the free will to do, but the rest is on God. The actual manifestation of the reality that happens after like we're in, in control of like our intention of what we intend to do, but the rest is on God, right? So this this is a really important lesson for a lot of people who might have um, maybe a hard time letting go of the outcome of things or having a hard time with when it comes to control. You know, people who tend to be very careful, people who are very risk averse, I know I'm a very risk averse person as well. They tend to live their lives in a kind of anxiety and a fear and rethinking and rethinking and overthinking ad nauseum what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. And they try to control every little detail of their lives in an effort to hold on tight to all the things that they have that keeps them safe. Hold on tight to their, you know, their jobs and their relationships and their you know their money and and they and slowly and slowly and slowly they're like this so there's this tension that comes there's this kind of fear that comes with it because they haven't really fully embodied and understood the concept of like wait i don't control any of this anyway so i will do what i can but the rest is on god so maybe the actions look the same Showing up at work, doing your best, doing your best to show up in your relationships, doing your best to do the work that is on you. Both both scenarios where the person is not trusting in God and the person who is trusting in God, they might look the same on the outside. But the fuel that drives that person to move is completely different. And therefore, the the wellness of that person, that the, the calm of that person or the anxiety of that person is completely different. One person is going to dig themselves an early grave with stress and maybe even push away their loved ones because they're too controlling. And maybe even turn off their coworkers because they come off as too controlling to the point where they don't trust even their coworkers to, to do a good job. Or they're a parent who is so anxious about how their kid is going to be that they end up pushing their child away because they're constantly on their case and they don't trust and show a trust in their child. That child or the child ends up adopting that parent's anxiety. And then that child grows up to be a very anxious person. Right? But on the other hand, the person who's trusting Allah, who does what they have to do and lets the rest go and lets it give it to Allah, will find a kind of peace that comes. It's a practice, right? Everything is a practice. Whatever you practice, you get good at. So if you practice anxiety, you'll get really good at anxiety. If you practice thinking that everything is in your control, you're going to get really good at just thinking that all the time. But if you practice God consciousness, you'll get good at that. If you trust letting go, if you trust, if you, if you practice, I mean, letting go, if you practice unclenching the, the grip on your reality and giving it to God, you'll get good at that, right? This is, this is why we, you know, we have to do things like salah multiple times a day because it's a practice. You're not going to get it right away. It's a practice. This is, this is the whole, you know, the whole concept of being Muslim. It's like it's a, it's a constant evolution. It's a constant ebb and flow. It's a constant flux. You know, our state towards Allah changed. Sometimes they're doing well and sometimes they're not. And acceptance is a huge part of that. So one thing that I do want to talk about in relation to acceptance is resistance, right? And part of that resistance also comes with our emotions. So sometimes something happens to us that's stressful. And now we're stressed, right? We're stressed that this thing happened. If we don't just accept the fact that 
okay, I am stressed right now. Allah is doing this right now to me. And I'm going to trust him. What happens is I'm stressed. Oh my God, I'm so stressed that I'm stressed right now. And now you have an extra layer of stress on top of the regular stress that you didn't need, <laughs> right? Or you get sad about something and then you get start worrying about the fact that you're sad and you're like, oh, I shouldn't be sad. I should avoid my feelings. Then you start of trying to avoid your feelings and then the sadness tries to get buried, but it still keeps coming up. So you keep avoiding it. So you keep getting more anxious and you become more stressed. And then you're creating layers upon layers upon layers of stress that you didn't need if you just accepted the initial feeling that was coming over you, accepted that this is a reality that Allah put inside of your heart or put inside of your in, inside of your environment, right? Or we might get angry. Someone will really anger us. And then we get angry at the fact that we're even feeling angry. I was having a great day and now you got made me angry. Now I'm not, I'm not even just angry about the thing that you did. Now I'm angry about the fact that I'm angry. And so your anger multiplies and it grows. And then you get more stressed and we create all these layers and layers, right? And there's a poem that I want to share that I think is really um, important. It's by the scholar named Zumi. And it's called The Guest House. Maybe some of you have heard of it. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat that guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door, laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. I'm gonna read the last part one more time. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. What do you think he means when he said a guide from beyond? So he's saying each emotion has been sent into your guest house as a guide from beyond. Does anyone have any idea what that might mean? Why would I welcome my sadness in laughing? Like, yes, come in, sweep my house empty of its furniture. What about beyond? What do you think? Who is beyond? We're all sleeping here. Beyond, in this case, Rumi is talking about God. A guide from God. So why, how can our emotions be a guide from God? They're trying to teach us something about ourselves, right? And this is related to another um, quote from Rumi where he says that every, every negative thing that happens to you is a reminder to show you what's blocking you from God. Because sometimes we get so in the in the midst of that carpet, really close in, and like we don't see the outside of it that we just forget. We become like the ant in the carpet with no knowledge, with no divine consciousness. And we just get lost in it. And sometimes God will remind us that we're forgetting him through either blessing or tribulation. Or it could be that you are remembering God, but there's still all these layers of your own ego that get in the way that keep you from getting closer. 
So God will do something, bring you something your way, and it will teach you, teach you something about yourself that you didn't even realize. We all have blind spots. We're, we're not perfect human beings. And Allah doesn't ask us, ask us to be human, perfect human beings. He asks us to be conscious, to be aware of our faults and seek tawbah. Tawbah literally means turning back, turning back to God, seeking out forgiveness. Oh, I, I forgot you, God. This is what we do. We're human beings. We forget, right? So if we're not in a state of acceptance, we're just running away from our emotions all the time instead of sitting with that feeling, sitting with that emotion. For example, I might have had a um, someone in my life who I really cared about and I got into an argument with them. Uh, they, they, they verbally like attacked me. I didn't do anything. And it, they really hurt me. Now I could say, God, why would you do this to me? Why me? I don't want this to happen to me. I don't want to feel this way. I just want to be friends again. But maybe God is showing you that this person isn't good for you. Maybe God is showing you that you've been accepting a friendship that is really unhealthy or a relationship that's really unhealthy and you have to walk away. Or maybe Allah is trying to show you that you have a really bad habit that hurts people. And this person said something to you when no one else could say anything to you in order to change that behavior in you. You had a blind spot. You didn't realize, for example, that, I don't know, you you just never asked about anybody but yourself. You never asked the person that you that you love about them. You're only only ever seeing yourself. Perhaps that's happening. But the point is that you have to have a kind of awareness of the divine at any given moment. When something, a calamity like that happens, has to be Allah wa na'mal wakil. That Allah is the best disposers of, disposer of affairs and he is sufficient for us. And that last part, he is sufficient for us, is describing that no matter what happens in this world, in this dunya, this dunya means this world, this finite place. Whatever happens in this world, Allah is sufficient. Like none of it actually matters ultimately as much as it does your relationship with Allah. Because Allah is the one who created this world in the first place, right? So has to be Allah wa na'mal wakil. Sufficient for us is Allah. And he's the best disposer of affairs. He is the expert. And God's good enough for me. No matter what's happening in my life, God is good enough for me. And it's easier said than done. Definitely. But like I said, whatever you practice, you get better at. So I think that I'm going to stop there. I think I want to keep it short and sweet. Um, and if anybody has any questions, please do ask. Thank you very much. Appreciate no that. Problem. Thank no you. Problem. Thank you very much. Uh, there was Jazakallah.